this year off by inviting you to join me as we dive into one of the most exciting and uh, encouraging and enigmatic books of the Old Testament, which is the book of Daniel. Uh, many of you, I, I hope, remember the sermon series I preached last year on the kings of Israel. We call it God of Thrones. Uh, and that series ended with the fall of Jerusalem and the, and the destruction of the entire kingdom of Judah. If you remember, uh, because the people of Judah persisted in idol worship and pagan practices and refused to repent, God handed them over to their enemies. He allowed the mighty Babylonian Empire led by King Nebuchadnezzar to invade the kingdom of Judah. And the Babylonian army just marched across the landscape. They surrounded the city of Jerusalem and they laid siege to it, its walls. Nebuchadnezzar's army <coughs> destroyed the Lord's temple. They decimated the royal palace and demolished every house in Jerusalem. The surviving Jews were taken captive and carted away as exiles to the kingdom of Babylon where they became servants and slaves for the next 70 years. But where the kingdom of Judah ended, the story of Daniel begins. Daniel's exploits are enthralling. Um, I mean, who can forget the story of Daniel in the lion's den, right? I mean, that's one that we teach our Sunday school kids and they all enjoy listening to it. And then there's the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And Daniel's uh, visions that he has periodically throughout the book are, are just as spellbinding and enthralling. I mean, he has visions of these bizarre beasts and, and creatures and, and war and destruction and all kinds of, of interesting images. And so... All of this, this book uh, centers around two recurring themes, God's sovereignty and Daniel's integrity. So for the next six weeks, I, I want to delve into the book of Daniel. And as we do, I want to encourage you to see how God works in and through Daniel. Because when we follow in Daniel's footsteps, when we live the kind of life that he lived, God will work in and through our lives in much the same way. So are you ready to dive in? Yes. Good. Let's get started. If you have a Bible or an app on your phone, go ahead and open it to Daniel chapter 1. This first chapter of Daniel introduces us to Daniel and his three friends that I mentioned before, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, by, by describing their burdens, their bravery, and also their blessing. Um, but first, it focuses on their burdens. Um, the, the opening verse of Daniel chapter 1, just sort of, it, it's like the previously on segment at the beginning of a television show. It just summarizes what has happened in Judah's history, and it tells us that Nebuchadnezzar and his army uh, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. That's a very concise summary of what happened. Um, but then the Bible moves the story forward, and it tells us, starting in verse 3, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. Now, I, I want you to try and imagine what these four young men had been through. Now, first of all, they were survivors of the, the siege of Jerusalem, which in and of itself was trauma on a, a whole other level. Now, like I said, the Babylonian army just surrounded the city of Jerusalem and, and cut them off from the outside world. Food quickly became scarce. Panic set in. Many of the, the people within the walls just immediately lost all sense of, of hope. Um, for two years, the Babylonians just waited outside the city while the citizens inside the walls slowly starved to death. Some of them resorted to cannibalism and others to things I won't even describe from up here in the pulpit. But finally, when the Jews had lost all sense of, of hope and dignity, 
Nebuchadnezzar launched his attack, knocked down the walls and invaded the city, and they began this brutal conquest of its citizens. The Bible uh, recounts in, in 2 Chronicles 36, and this again is just a short summary of the events. It says, the Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young men and young women, the old and the infirmed. Now just imagine being a 13-year-old kid surviving a bloodbath like that. If they didn't die from starvation, their parents, the parents of these four boys, were probably killed right in front of them. These kids had seen things that no one should ever have to see. But in addition to losing their families and their homes in this brutal attack, they were then taken captive and made slaves of the Babylonian Empire. And these four young men were chosen specifically because of their appearance. They were good-looking young men, apparently, and they were chosen for royal service in the palace. See, the king only surrounds himself with good-looking people. You know, he doesn't want any average people serving in his palace. So he picks, like, the healthiest, best-looking from these slaves and says, you're going to work for me. Can you just imagine spending the rest of your life as a servant to the man who slaughtered your family and destroyed your home? The king ordered them to be trained in the language and literature of Babylon, sort of like re-educating them in Babylonian ways. And to add insult to injury, the Bible says in, in verse 7, the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. Now why the name change? I mean, what did the Babylonians have a problem with the, the, the Hebrew names? Why did they feel the need to change it? Well, their Hebrew names gave glory to the one true God. Daniel meant uh, God is my judge, and uh, Hananiah means Yahweh has been gracious. Mishael means who compares to God. Azariah means Yahweh has helped me. Their new names glorified various pagan Babylonian gods. Belteshazzar means Bel will protect. Bel was one of their gods. Shadrach means inspired of a coup. That's another one of their gods. Meshach meant belonging to a coup. And Abednego means servant of Nego, another one of their many gods. This was a not so subtle attempt to strip the boys of their spiritual and religious identity and compel them to worship the false gods of Babylon. Daniel and his three companions experienced unimaginable burdens. I mean, the petty problems that we face on a daily basis pale in comparison to the trauma that these boys endured. And yet we all have burdens to bear, don't we? I mean, my burdens may never rival Daniel's, but there are days that I still struggle to bear them up. Now, your burdens are different than mine, but we, we all have them. Maybe you're bearing the burden of abandonment or abuse or addiction. Perhaps you're, you're struggling with resentment or rejection or regret, or you're weighed down by divorce and, and drunkenness and depression. And maybe you suffer from loneliness or you struggle with lust, or you might have bills that you can't pay and grades you can't make or people you can't please or, or whiskey you can't resist or pornography you can't refuse or a marriage you can't fix, or a career you can't escape, or a past you can't shake, or a future that you're just too afraid to face, our burdens can feel unbearable at times. But our destinies are determined by how we choose to respond when we're burdened. We can give in and we can collapse under the weight of our burdens, or we can trust in God to give us the strength to overcome. All throughout this book, Daniel and his three friends demonstrate total dependence upon God. These are, are men of faith. They were young men of prayer. They were totally committed to doing things God's way and living life His way and following Him in everything that He calls them to do. And, and these guys, these four men, not only survived their trauma, but they thrived in spite of it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 34, 3 through 4, that is, we rejoice in our sufferings. 
It's a strange thing to say, isn't it? We rejoice in our sufferings, but we do that because knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Hope is the light that cuts through the darkness. Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, they allowed their burdens to produce perseverance and character, and they never lost hope, no matter how dark things got in their lives. And if they can do that, then certainly we can too. Now furthermore, in addition to their burdens, though, this story goes on to reveal their bravery. Daniel's bravery in particular. Um, as the story continues, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar assigned a daily ration of food and wine from his own personal royal table to be served to all of the young men who were training for royal service. But the Bible says, and this is a longer section starting in verse 8, Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I'm afraid of my lord the king, who has ordered you to eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid that the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and said, Please test us for ten days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for ten days, and at the end of the ten days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the king's food, uh, the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. You know, like Darren mentioned, this time of year, a lot of us are thinking about new diets, and, uh, and you know, maybe you want to lose weight, or, or you want to just have more energy. Ashley was telling me about this article she read just the other day about all of the, you know, the best and worst diets for 2020, and it talked about the keto diet, and the Atkins diet, and the Jenny Craig diet, and the Weight Watchers diet, and the Mediterranean diet, and you know, the list just goes on and on. In fact, a couple of years ago, uh, Pastor Rick Warren came out with a book titled the Daniel plan, which is actually a diet based on this passage in Scripture. It's a diet of vegetables and water. And I always thought that that was interesting because Daniel, you know, he didn't make this choice because he wanted to lose weight or get fit or anything like that. Rather, Daniel was bravely standing up for his convictions. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why Daniel refused to eat the king's food and wine. But there's a few reasons why these Jewish boys would want to abstain from the royal food. First of all, it's very likely that the king's rations included pork, which in the Old Testament God commanded the Jews not to eat pork because pigs were considered unclean. And so for Daniel to eat that food, it would defile himself and he would be disobeying God. And then, of course, he couldn't eat anything that the pork touched either. On top of that, it's also very likely that the food served to the king had been sacrificed to one of these many pagan gods. And so whether it was pork or beef or chicken or whatever, it had still been sacrificed to some pagan deity. And Daniel wouldn't want to participate in the worship of those false gods, so he didn't want to eat that food. And then additionally, by Eastern standards, sharing a meal was a sign of fellowship and favor. By accepting the king's food, he was by extension accepting the king, the giver of that gift. See, this, the, the subtle flattery of royal food and, and wine entailed hidden implications of loyal support. So when Daniel made up his mind not to defile himself with the king's food and wine, he was being true to a lifelong determination to do what's right and not give in or conform to the pressures of the surrounding culture. 
Daniel courageously clung to his convictions. And you'll notice that the, the chief of staff, when Daniel first brought up this objection, he's like, dude, I'm afraid I'm going to get my head chopped off if you don't eat and look good the way that the other ones did. And so, I mean, obviously, if the chief of staff is afraid of that, certainly Daniel had his life on the line, too. I mean, if he disobeyed the king's orders and it didn't go very well for him, then he would likely be beheaded. And yet, even at the threat of death, Daniel refused to compromise his convictions. And there's an important lesson there for us. You know, we too are often assaulted by pressures to compromise our standards and to live more like the world around us. And our surrounding cultures are going to fight for our loyalty. Even if we don't serve in the king's court like Daniel did, you know, our culture, our, our company that we work for, our political party, you know, our, our peers, everybody is going to be fighting for our loyalty. Our culture wants us to agree with them and be on their side regardless of what else is going on. And, and when we refuse to conform, we run the risk of, of being mocked and maligned and marginalized by society. But by compromising biblical values and Christian convictions, we conform to a corrupt and ungodly culture, which is exactly what Daniel refused to do. And every time that we make a compromise, it's just that much easier to compromise again and again and again until we look nothing like the Christianity that we were called to. Like Daniel, we're called to be brave, to be bold and stand firm. But also like Daniel, we can do so in a respectful and reasonable way. You'll notice that Daniel didn't, you know, just adamantly refuse. He didn't step forward and say, I'm not eating this stuff and knock it on the floor or anything like that. He very respectfully asked not to eat this stuff. And then understanding the chief, you know, uh, the, the guy in charge, what's his name, the, the, the chief of staff's um, objections to it, realizing, okay, yeah, I, I know you could get in trouble if I don't do this. He comes up with this, this alternative. He's like, just test us out for a little while. Give us 10 days of this alternative diet of veggies and water and, and then make your decision. You know, base it on, on the results. And, and so he, without compromising, Daniel quickly thought up this practical, creative solution that saved his life and the lives of his friends. And not only that, but Daniel ended up changing the minds of his Babylonian supervisors, this attendant and the chief, chief of staff, by showing them a better way. And you and I can do the same thing within our own culture, within our community, when we bravely stand up for what's right and respectfully demonstrate that God's way works. So finally, in addition to his burdens and his bravery, this introduction also spotlights Daniel's blessing. Daniel's blessing. Uh, because Daniel and his friends <coughs> remained faithful to God despite their circumstances, they experienced God's blessing. Uh, later in the, the last chapter, or the last few verses of this chapter conclude this way. It says, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all of the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel maintained steadfast allegiance to God, and God blessed Daniel with unparalleled wisdom and insight. So Daniel used his special blessing as a royal advisor to the king for the next 70 years, the entire time they were in captivity. And while serving as an advisor to the kings of Babylon, Daniel becomes God's spokesman to the entire nation, to the, the Babylonian empire. Babylon was an evil empire, but it would have been much worse without Daniel's influence. And you know, you and I may not be as wise as Daniel, and we certainly aren't likely to be asked to be advisors to the president at any time in the near future, but 
the truth is God blesses everyone that is faithful to Him with a variety of gifts and talents, and He expects us to use those unique abilities in His service. For example, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, do you have that verse in there? No? Oh, it's missing. Okay, I've got it on mine. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, God has given each of you a gift from His great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. You know, if I were to ask some of you what your spiritual gift is, I, I know a lot of you would probably know immediately. Others might not have a clue, and that's okay. But, but it's tremendously important for us to discover and use the gifts that God has given you to serve your, your church, your community, and even your country to God's glory. And God doesn't just bless us with talents either. He also gives us time and treasure, and we can use all of these things in God's service to further His kingdom and His agenda. God intends for us to use the blessings that He has given us, whatever those blessings happen to be, for the common good and to help one another and to build up the entire church. Daniel wasn't given wisdom and insight simply for his own benefit. And the same is true for, for us. God blesses us so that we can bless others. Daniel used his blessing to make the glory and greatness of God known to an ungodly nation. And you and I can do the same thing with the gifts that God's given us. So as we survey this first chapter in Daniel's story, we're introduced to this young man with burdens, being ripped away from his home and forced to serve in a strange land. He's also a young man with bravery, maintaining his convictions and refusing to conform to the corrupt culture surrounding him. And he's a young man with blessings, a gift of wisdom and knowledge that he used to influence a nation for the better. Of course, Daniel's story is just beginning. And next week, we'll see how Daniel handles an impending disaster when the king has a disturbing dream. In the meantime, though, if you feel bur buried beneath your own burdens, maybe you're struggling with some issues that you're still lingering and dealing with from 2019, I want to encourage you to bring those burdens to Jesus. Just lay your burdens at the foot of the cross and experience and find rest for your soul. And if I can help you figure out how to do that, you're not really sure what all that means, come talk to me, pull me aside after church or call me at home or just come forward now while we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.